uh, it's great to be up here with my esteemed colleagues, uh, Martin and Ben. That was uh, good, good stuff. So let's see. It's always fun when the presenter starts out on a high wire trying to do a live demo. And uh, I, I don't know how many of you, oh, zero points of interest, of course, it's going to fail. Okay. You know what? The, uh, the Wi-Fi here is a little sketchy sometimes, so bear with me for just a second. Let me try this once. Nope, zero points of interest. Okay, never mind. Try to go to the browser first. Yeah, you have to initialize the browser, browser first. first. Oh, is that what it is? Okay, all right. All right, let's see. Thank you for being the sacrifice to the demo gods. You yeah. are now connected. Okay, let's see if I believe that or not. Okay. So anybody who's used Layer probably knows the tweeps around application shows our local Twitter users who are tweeting around us. There's, hey, Christopher Smith. And uh, wow, you guys are really big here. Mm -hmm. a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of different folks out in the audience tweeting about ARE. Gosh, there's another one. OK, so look at that. Layer works, and the people out here are tweeting. And let's get down to the conversation. Okay, so, um, so I'm Gene Becker. Layer, and I'd like to talk about the Layer platform. So, as as you may or may not know, we have uh, our, a platform that consists of the Layer Augmented Reality Browser, which is client software that runs on your phone. We have our publishing platform, and including today the uh, Layer Connect functionality that we announced for third-party developers to create content management systems for the Layer platform. And we also have the Layer Player SDK, which is our embeddable AR engine for iPhone developers to create their own third-party applications that are custom branded outside of the Layer browser. Um, so this is our platform. Um, we are a, a pure play mobile platform company. We don't create AR content ourselves. Uh, we make a platform that enables other people to develop content uh, and then publish it. And this is all basically free to use free to develop for, there are no licensing costs. Uh, we're really trying to build a large community around our platform. Uh, some key features here. Um, the Layer platform supports rich media, so images and audio and video and of course 3D objects. Um, in our 5.0 release, which we launched recently, we support animation, so we can have animated objects as well. Um, we also launched um, sharing to Facebook and Twitter, and so now we start to build a social dimension into the AR experience. Um, Layer has had for a long time the uh, built-in actions, so basically launching web pages and uh, uh, emails and sharing and, uh, and even placing phone calls, which has turned out to be a useful thing for applications that are about people finding resources in the city when they're out walking around. Um, we also have dynamic elements in the platform, so launching from a URL that's called an intent in the Android world, and we have similar capability for the iPhone world. Uh, auto triggers, so basically launching media based on your proximity to a point of interest. Um, relative poise, so creating POIs that are actually relative to the user as opposed to somewhere specific lat long. Um, and we have point-to-point -point capability where you can actually go from one point to another by linking within a layer. In fact, you can even link from one layer to another layer and launch a layer from inside a layer, which can lead to all sorts of interesting recursive things. Uh, I mentioned the Layer Player SDK, so you want to develop your own iPhone app, uh, branded, and embed our AR engine in it. The development model is exactly the same as for standard layer content. Uh, we also have a payment platform built around uh, PayPal integration. Uh, we have, uh, at this point, about a million and a half active users on the platform, which I think uh, allows us to claim that we're the, uh, we have the largest reach of any AR browser in the world. Uh, we think this is interesting. A million and a half is a lot of people. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, it's actually kind of small, because as an industry, on mobile, we're actually competing for people's attention with things like email and Twitter and Facebook. And so I think the thing that's incumbent on us as AR creators and developers is how do we actually make content that's as interesting um, and as attention grabbing as what people are finding in those other mobile applications. So million and a half, interesting, let's go for 15. 
Uh, we are cross-platform, so we're primarily on iPhone and Android, uh, also on the Symbian and Vata smartphone platforms. Uh, there are over 2,000 layers right now in the catalog, and these are individual content layers that have been created by third parties, uh, since we don't do uh, any content development ourselves. These are all uh, third-party developers. Um, so let's talk about developing. Let's talk about the alternatives for creating layers. And there are really four main things, right? You can build a layer service from scratch, and that's for the hardcore developer. Um, you can build on top of a framework, uh, something that's been provided, some tools that have been built by our community. Uh, you can use a hosted content management service, so you don't have to do the hosting and maybe not even any back-end coding. Um, or you can actually hire one of our professional certified layer partner network members to build a layer for you commercially. And this is something that a lot of brands and ad agencies actually think is the best option, which is, hey, I just want to outsource this stuff. I don't want to have to build it myself. So um, I, I won't go deep into the architecture. Obviously, it's a very high-level picture. But uh, you know, on the left, we have the client device, which is using sensors to gather information about the user's context. We have our own layer server infrastructure, uh, which provides the interface out to the developer's layer services. And so effectively as a developer, what you're doing is you're taking content sources, creating interactive, um, you know, essentially applications, and then writing to our API uh, in order to publish in augmented reality. And our API is actually very straightforward. It's a, it's a web-based API. In fact, it's primarily implemented in a single HTTP GET call. Um, so there's GET POISE request, so basically, um, if I'm a user at a particular location with a set of contextual parameters, then my device is going to send out a request that says, hey, here I am, what should I be seeing? And so you take the get points request and the parameters, and you come back with a JSON encoded response called get poise response that says, here's your points of interest. So there's a bunch of documentation online, layer.pbworks.com, where you can get the details on that. Um, I won't go into what the code looks like, but if you've ever done a, a, a URL encoded request, you'll recognize the tiny type there. Um, so, other alternatives. Porpoise is uh, an open source point of interest server. Jens de Smit um, developed this, and uh, effectively it gives you the guts of a layer server that you can build on top of. It's open source, it's under the BSD license, and it actually has a lot of up-to-date functionality, including things like the animations of objects, which was just released in our 5.0 version. So this is a really good place to start if you don't want to kind of build everything from the crufty ground up. Um, if you want the easy example, uh, Hopala, augmentation.hopala.eu is a totally free hosted content management system that's basically point and click. Um, you know, it supports 2D and 3D objects, it supports audio and audio triggers. Um, it doesn't do bulk import of poise, so if you've got a huge database, this is not your tool. But if you're doing rapid prototyping or end user development, this is a great tool. Uh, buildr.com, not to be confused with the HitLabs Buildr, is a, is a tool out of uh, Mob Labs that is more of a professional content management system. And this is something that will allow you to do large scale layer development. Um, and it's a, it's a fee based system. And I think uh, Rob Manson, if he's not in the room today, uh, right now, will be talking about this a little bit later in another session. Another example of a content management system is Visar from Musar. This is another professional sort of enterprise grade CMS. Uh, again, it's a four-pay solution, but it gives you a great deal of functionality for building out layers without necessarily doing a lot of the back-end plumbing yourself. Uh, and of course, we have our commercial partners, a network of over 50 commercial layer partners who develop uh, this stuff for, uh, for hire and can do it for you if you like. Um, what do these guys make, right? I mean, they, you know, the tools are great, but the content is really important, right? And so, you know, what we see is a broad range of things that people are creating. We've got history layers. We've got art layers. We've got, uh, well, we've got street art layers. This is actually a great example of a layer player SDK integration. This is street art app, which is a standalone iPhone app. Uh, we've got tourism layers, one of the canonical AR examples. Uh, this is an example around the Cirque du Soleil installation at Disneyland, uh, Disney World in uh, Orlando. Um, this is uh, 
an outdoor advertising layer built to uh, help promote the Disney Prince of Persia film, Sands of Time. Uh, here's an example of a layer for the Orlando magic of the NBA. Um, Polydor Records and the Rolling Stones, there's a layer for, uh, it's called Exile on Your Street, a lot of fun, you should pull it up and try it out. You can actually place posters and songs from the Rolling Stones catalog into AR and send it to a friend. Um, the layer augmented office is an example of showing using 3D content. And in, in, it's almost like a second life in first life sort of example. You find yourself inside this building. And uh, it's, a, it's a great example of kind of the edge of development for 3D right now on the platform. Uh, tweets around, of course, canonical uh, social app. The InstaPhotos app, which shows Instagram photos around you. Uh, I'll bet there are some going on in the conference right now worth checking out. Um, and the guys in the white suits in the keynote, um, Space Liberation something, they've kind of got this protest layer going on and people are pulling in things like, you know, the you know supporters of the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei into uh, AR. So a really incredibly broad range. And yet, we're still really early in the development of AR as a medium, right? So these examples are really just teasers, of course, for where we're going. And as a, as a closer, I'd like to throw out a challenge uh, because I, I think we have only begun to scratch the surface of the creativity that's out there that developers can take advantage of. People love history layers, but how about a global layer that contains the history of the entire world? Um, New York City just opened up their 311 data set. How about layers that pull that data in and visualize it? How about showing you know, climate change scenarios in the place where you are? How about the first social API layer like tweets around or like Instagram, that's actually better than the original app. I mean, AR has to add something here. So how do we actually make it better than, I mean, make a better Twitter than Twitter itself? Um, the Doctor Who layer, the Fringe layer, the Grateful Dead layer. I mean, there's so many opportunities out there, great content that people are passionate about that need to get built. And uh, actually what I'd love to see is, I'd love to see a layer that aggregates all of these different cross-platform locative media things, right? A layer that shows you Junio channels, and, a, and it shows Wikitude worlds, and it shows broadcaster audio stories, and GeoLoki GeoNotes, all in one space, right? I mean, we shouldn't necessarily be dividing AR space up into so many different factions. We should be starting to aggregate it together into a single view. Okay, so that's me, and I guess do, if we have time for a couple of questions, we'll take them. This may be actually a question that we could post to all three panelists, but um, you know, we, Qualcomm's obviously doing a lot in the, in the AR space, very hardware optimized uh, platform. Can you comment on the advantages? Do you guys see big advantages to that level of hardware optimization and, and hardware specificity, or do you think you know sort of the cross hardware platform fits better? Or what do you guys? What's your thinking on that? Yeah, you know, it's, um, I have mixed feelings about it. On the one hand, I think it's really important to make AR available to an incredibly broad population of people, uh, which means you need to be cross-platform, you need to have something that actually works um, without necessarily having to be on specific optimized platforms. On the other hand, I really do recognize the contribution that we're seeing around people that are pushing the edges of computer vision technology, and of course, given the state of hardware today, that really does require incredibly optimized algorithms and hardware and GPU, all that stuff, right? So somewhere in there we're gonna meet. I honestly believe it's early days for computer vision heavy AR in the consumer world, right? It's, it's pretty early for that. Um, and, and I think the sensor-based stuff that we're doing, while it doesn't stress the platforms as much, is something that people can get access to and can start to think creatively about. So I, I think we'll meet somewhere in the middle. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>